Welcome okay. everybody and thank you for coming to our ABLE and ePortfolios Australia workshop. This is another one in a series really that we've been running through uh, at least last year and probably more into this year. And I'm Associate Professor Christine Slade from the University of Queensland and you've met Christina already if you've been online. She's from Catalyst in IT in New Zealand. So today we're looking at one particular um, principle from the digital um, suite, from the digital task force from ABLE, and we're going to look at respect author rights and reuse permissions. And of course that entails quite a lot of things. So we'll work our way through, and as Christina said, we want this to be very um, interactive. This is a quick overview of what we'll be doing in the next hour, hour and a half. Um, so we have a group agreement. Who is this task force that everyone keeps talking about for quite a number of years now? What exactly are the principles? We'll be doing um, activities um, to further think about the principle of respect author rights and reuse permissions, and then another activity, and then where to from here. And we do want to encourage you um, to pose questions if you have them. Um, we will get your brains thinking about different contexts for this principle, but we do want to be able to help um, engage in any questions that you have. Uh, if you haven't been online um, for more than a few minutes, this is the link, and I think Christine is probably going to put it again into the chat, where you can access the material. So things that you'll need and information that we provide, we've sort of put it in together. Um, so if you want to QR code it or put in the link, that's that will give you where we're up to today. Now, when we discuss ethical things, we do like to talk about group agreements. So what is a safe session here? Uh, and I guess the first thing to say at, in the get outright is that everyone's here to learn and challenge their own perceived, pre preconceived notions and biases. So we're here really for our own professional uh, learning. So that means that we'll listen to other people who, uh, without judgment because we may not agree with what everybody's saying, um, but we're here to learn for ourselves. So we need to be open to receive feedback and be able to discuss arguments as a topic, not uh, argue with a person in particular or other people who differ in opinions. So everything that we talk about today in the breakout rooms will be confidential. So if you want to share something that's really important in your particular context, please feel free to do that in the breakout room. If you don't want to actually say who you are when you're listening, you can actually change your Zoom handle and you do that by just placing your cursor on your name and right click, I believe, and you can change it to what you would like. So as I suggested, who is this ABLE Digital Ethics Task Force? So if you're not familiar with ABLE, let me see if I can get this right. It's the Association of Authentic, Experiential and Evidence-Based Learning, which are all things that I totally get excited about. Um, um, and it's, it's an association run in North America, um, but of more recent years, um, in particular, different communities of practice and um, organizations around the world regarding e-portfolios have come together uh, more to share things like this, professional learning, and to, to um, I guess, address difficult issues that we might have. So in about year, oh, of this, I'll just give you the pictures of us all, aren't we lovely? So Christina is one of the co-chairs, and we also have Megan, or Megan, depending where you live, Sarah, they're three co-chairs this year. So the task force has been running for a, a number of years. I think this is the fourth year, isn't it, Christina? Uh, you can see Michael there, so he's in the audience today from Philippines, so that's great. And Amy, Elizabeth, Teresa, Morgan, Kevin, Peter and Sheila are from, and Colin and Jeffrey, because they're newer people to the fossils, are actually from North America. But there's Christina from New Zealand and myself from Australia. And um, we're foundation members of this. We've been running with this for about four years. I guess because, um, you know, we're seeing even more so now the need for addressing digital ethics. Um, and, you know, we didn't know that COVID was going to come. 
and now we've got you know gen ai coming around all these things that are hitting on us and we knew earlier on probably preempting that this was an underdeveloped area of research and scholarship and even pre covid we knew that it was a topic that was rapidly changing because of all different technologies laws digital practices and of course that's been exacerbated now by these more uh, recent events so it was an opportunity for an international organization like able to advocate for ethically sound e-portfolio practices so i view the task force i guess is focused on e-portfolios but i'm also um, involved in research and practice around other digital pedagogies and ethics in the digital environment generally. And I could say that these principles relate not only to e-portfolios, but to digital environment generally. Over to you, Christina. Thank you so much, Christine, for the start on this. And yes, the Digital Ethics Task Force has existed since 2019, so roughly about September 2019. And um, I did put the link to the uh, to the principles into the chat, so please do feel free to take a look at them. And so altogether, we have ten principles that we developed, and the. Uh, originally, there were 10 principles, then in the second year, we added three more, then in the third year, we consolidated some principles because we saw a lot of overlap. And so here on this slide, you can see the uh, principles and uh, the link that I had just put into the chat to them takes you directly to them. And our principles are quite diverse. Um, because we look at everything from accessibility, and today we are looking in particular at respect author rights and reuse permissions. And um, but we also look at how to get started. What does support look like? Um, how to be how to raise awareness of digital ethics? What uh, uh, what does happen to the data? So we have data responsibility practice and also have one principle on technology and usability besides the very big principles of visibility of labor for which we've had a workshop last a couple of workshops actually last year that have also been recorded if you want to look at that more closely evaluation of course is also a very big principle and then also uh, diversity equity inclusion belonging and decolonization so those three principles, the IBD, visibility of labor, and also evaluation kind of can probably be seen as more guiding larger principles because there's lots of connecting points to the others. Um, and so what we had done is because we wanted to be very consistent in our approach and what we see to make things easier. Each principle is structured pretty much in the same way. And so every principle has a rationale that is a very brief overview of what the principle is about. Then it has a number of strategies. That means how we can apply the principle. They are also, we also provide scenarios to give examples of the context in which you might um, encounter the principle or how you might be able to include it in your own practice. And all of that is rounded up by a number of resources, which of course are not exhaustive. They are examples of the resources available for further reading. And if you feel like there is missing anything, then do let us know, uh, because we are always expanding the list of resources, because of course, over the last four years, um, there have already been new elements coming in and new research being done. So before we now go into the principle of author rights and reuse permissions, We'd like to know a little bit more about yourselves, because we don't just want to talk to you. Today is a workshop. And um, of course, we know that we have people in here who have been working with portfolios for well over a decade. And we might also have people here in the room who are very new. But instead of using very technology-driven um, 
terminology, I thought it might be fun to look at us more as emerging butterflies. So if you'd like to describe your experience level using portfolios, either like Alison has done, she even found the emoji for it, fantastic. You can put it into the chat or you can also use a stamp here for with the annotation tool on the slides. But we have four stages. The egg, that's pretty much when you've only just heard about the terminology, might have also just started looking into digital ethics. But in this case, it is really around portfolios. So you're really, really new to it here. You've kind of just been born in that space. Then there's the caterpillar stage that you're still new and you're just eating everything up to grow. And therefore you eat as much as you can in order to understand what's actually going on. Then we have the chrysalis. So that is your, your finished the caterpillar stage. You've eaten up all the things and now you're making sense of it. You're transforming, you're in metamorphosis. You change your practice, you try different practices and you try different ideas. If you're that person, then you're a chrysalis. And then you're the butterfly when you are really ready to roll or you've already taken on a lot of things in the world of ePortfolios. You share your work and you continue learning from others. So if you'd like to share at which stage you are, please use the chat for that. Um, or if you want to explain your position, also please feel free to use the microphone. So we have at least one butterfly in here, chrysalises um, or chrysalis, people in metamorphosis, which is fantastic. And yes, as Christine says, if you, you might actually be mo moving between some of the stages depending on the topic of ePortfolios, because we are not always experts in everything. So also we on the task force, if we learn, we, we might be knowing quite a few things about portfolios, but there's always something new like digital ethics, where we are then kind of bumping back to the learning stage. Um, and most recently, of course, the whole conversation around artificial intelligence, especially generative AI, has also bumped us back very much into that learning stage. But we can, that's kind of why it, it still says continuing to learn from others is also part of the butterfly state, because even though we are grown ups, we, we are hopefully all still learning. All right. So it looks like um, that we have mostly people in the later stages already quite experienced with portfolios, but also at least. Um, one caterpillar, it doesn't look like anybody's completely new to the topic, which will probably make it a bit easier in the breakout rooms. But even if you do not have a lot of knowledge, we do want you to participate um, and share from your own experience. Uh, that is already a very good stage to kind of get into that caterpillar stage. And yes, soaking everything up. Thank you so much for participating in this very brief activity. And so I'd like to hand it back over to Christine. That was great. I wish some other people might have put something there, but I hope you're reflecting on what level you're at. But, you know, it's not a hierarchy. I, I think sometimes I'm back to the caterpillar. If someone dis discovers something new, I just kind of want to know about it and lap it up. So I think you know, we can go from one to the other and it's not linear. We can go round and round. So it's a very interesting way to express um, where you feel you're at. So, you know, keep putting it there if you've been thinking about it. Um, there's no right or wrong. Um, and if English is not your first language or your additional language, it's an additional language, please feel free to put it in your own language because other people might be here that can share that as well and understand it. So uh, let's dive a little bit more into the principle, respect author rights and reuse permissions. So you may have that open already from the, um, the materials from today or from uh, that Christina shared. So we're going to actually, um, I think it's right in the chat, isn't it, Christina? 
so we're going to actually yes, uh, yes. think a little bit more. So you've had a bit of time, not a lot, to think, um, you know, what does this mean and read some information, but what does this principle mean to you? That's what we're thinking about now. So, you know, different scenarios with students might flash across your mind or some challenge that you've had to face just in your own life. Um, so we're thinking about that more deeply. So as Christina said, every principle in the copies that you'll be looking at have a rationale to start with. So this is a general summary of what we considered as the authors of this material um, to be why we have it and what it actually contains. If you haven't got the principles yet, you can use the QR code. So I'll just read this because so we have a shared understanding. Because ePortfolios ask creators to reuse text and media, they need a working, that's they, the creators, need a working knowledge of plagiarism, copyright, fair use and licensing. Students should be ethical owners of their ePortfolios and engage in conversations about how to responsibly move artifacts into ePortfolios. Particularly when artifacts represent professional or collaborative experiences or involve the representation of others. Now that sounds really simple, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's actually quite complicated. And um, it differs from what country you're in too as to what the rules are about, you know, licensing in particular. And so we start thinking about what this means for you. Uh, for those of you who come from the Southeast Asia group, um, we've had some discussions about some of these things. So you might like to think about how that works in your school scene or in your teaching um, practice. Okay, so we've broken that down. Now we're looking at the strategies. So in the materials online, you'll see after now rationale, there's strategies. And we've classified these because there's quite a number of them that give examples of how to, you know, what how this might work out in teaching as a student or as a staff member. And so we just categorize that into three to help us for today. So I just mentioned about licensing. Um, so that Licensing can also mean, you know, in some ways, uh, I'm thinking of the Australian context where licensing is often managed by an institutional division or a department like the um, ITS services, you know, the IT services. So we don't have a lot to do with that particular side of licensing. But we do, as educators, have a lot of to do with about copyright and fair use and the idea of sharing things, for example, of our materials through the different levels of Creative Commons. So we do have a big part to play in the actual on the ground experience of licensing. I guess representation of others is something that I have been working on for a while because we realise that students don't actually understand necessarily how to do that. They might think they do, but they don't always understand the nuances of how to not only represent others, but the permission to show the artifacts. So content, consent and privacy, particularly around images of children, vulnerable people, but other people as well. And as I said, there's cultural context rules and regulations that go with this as well. So keep that in mind as we go along. Now, Christina has a lovely example to share here. So I'll ask you to explain a little bit more about it. Thank you, Christine. I'll also put the, the link to the to the full example into the chat. Uh, since it's a podcast interview, please, uh, you, you're very welcome to listen to it later. Um, in the principle itself, you find uh, four scenarios that were examples, and our examples are always rooted in reality, but then they are also um, kind of made more like proto examples where we pull things together so that, of course, identifying information is not available and we generalize them. Recently, I've had the chance to talk with Christina Dülfer. Uh, she works at a German vocational school with students that are apprentices. So they have, um, there we have a dual, school, uh, dual, system where the vocational students 
work in the classroom for half the week and then they also work in the apprenticeship company for, for the rest of the week. And for many, many years, Christina has been using portfolios. And this is a really good example for the respect to author rights and reuse permissions, in particular around licensing and representation of others. Because of course, when you work in a commercial company, a lot of times you're not allowed to take photos or you're not allowed to take videos because there might be some confidential information that the company does not want to uh, make public or not even just share with the school or with other students, which of course then could mean that the portfolios are very much relegated to text so that students can describe things, but they can't show the actual evidence. And so Christine found a really, or Christina in this case, um, found a <laughs> really nice way of still enabling her students to work with multimedia content, yet also respecting the culture, the rules and regulations of the workplaces. So here I'd just like to share three of the strategies that she's come up with, which I think can also be made uh, more general and can also apply to the university context or when you work with organizations that might be a bit fearful of not making certain information public. It can also work for working with vulnerable communities because typically we know that if you work with children, you shouldn't really have their, their faces visible in portfolios because parents might object and the students, the young students uh, don't necessarily understand what it actually means to have their picture taken. But let's go back to our apprentices. So one idea that Christina has is that the students take screenshots instead of photos and blank out sensitive information. So they often work with software. And that means then that they take a screenshot of the software of a spreadsheet or an order form or in any, any other administrative uh, tool. And if needed, blank out uh, specifics like who's been ordering what or for what reason, but yet still show all the numbers and then explain what they have been working on, reflect on what they have done, and uh, therefore can still include the more tangible result of their work. Uh, because all the apprentices that Christina works with work in different companies, what she likes to do is to expand the horizon of all her students to learn more about how different companies work, that the students talk about their companies. But of course, again, they are not really allowed to take any photos while they are within the company buildings or take any videos. So instead, Christine asked them to draw a map and the students take their fellow students on an audio tour. In this case, drawing a map works. If you were to work for a very secret organization where you're not allowed to know where things are at or where the rooms are, that might not work. But in this case, this was acceptable to the companies that she works with and is a very nice alternative to show a bit more of the organizations. The last part, I have actually already talked in the, the screenshots about the sensitive information that you um, blanket out, but what captured my attention when Christina was telling me about this idea is that she really makes it part of the assignment. So she doesn't assume that the students already know what they need to do in order put to protect the privacy or intellectual property that they get in contact with, but uh, that she makes it very explicit in order to instill that caring for that private information into her students. So they also understand why they are doing that, why they are obliged for it. That's kind of the example that I wanted to share with you briefly. Um, 
because we exemplify a number of our strategies on that, or rather Christina is, um, namely that representations of others and permission also to show artifacts is um, ticked off by the students because they make sure that no sensitive information is there. That also means that they um, comply with the rules and regulations of their workplaces. And um, that is already two out of the three categories that we have uh, talked about. But I also know that in general, the information around licensing is also dealt with in classes in Germany. And that means I'll hand back over to Christine. So thank you, Christina. That was a really interesting um, example, and it might give us some ideas for some of our work later as we go into the breakout rooms. So now coming back to everyone here, uh, we're going to look more into our own environments. And the question posed here is, well, what is your challenge? Now, to do this, we're going to use a Padlet. So that's the QR code. That on the screen, so you can just put your phone to it, or there is a, do we have the link? I'm not sure. Yes. Yes, um, I Christi just put Christine it into the Christine is chat. always great with all of these things. You can just ask and she just pops it in there. Um, so we're going to think of challenges. And so given, remember the topic and all the different areas that we explained there, what is perhaps your key challenge? Because I imagine we'll have a few people writing there. And you can just post it up as a card or just go to one of the cat. We have lined it up in categories across the Padlet, but please feel free to just put what you consider your challenge in whatever area. So as you click in, you can just post it wherever you like. And this is only half of what we're going to do. So obviously we're going to look at some of those challenges as an individual exercise or reflection, but later on we will be going into breakout rooms where we start to try and address some of the strategies that um, in relationship to the challenges that you have in your group. So we'll post them up as well, but that's to come a bit later on. So we'll just go to the Padlet. And anyone got any problems with doing it, please let us know. We have a lot of techie people in the audience and they'll be able to help you. Um, and we'll give you about five minutes for this activity uh, so that you can think about your challenges. You might also want to check the principle in case you want to kind of see what areas we are considering as part of the topic respect to author rights and reuse permissions, just to jog your memory a bit. And so we do want to be a bit quiet so that you have time to think. If you have trouble accessing the Padlet, um, feel free to put your challenges in the chat and one of us can then transfer them to the Padlet itself. If you think you haven't encountered any challenges around portfolios and the topic, then please do feel free to widen the horizon and think about your teaching and learning in general because a lot of the things that we talk about in portfolios also apply more widely. So um, if that makes things easier, please take a look at those as well. If you finish sharing your challenge, you can always do what someone's done there and go around and put a light or a little heart or next to ones that you feel are things that you might be facing too. Or... Anyone have challenges with social media or policies around reuse? <clears throat> Universities have policies, but don't always translate to the practices or explaining to students. I think, Christine, let's, yeah. let's move on because yeah. we have a number of really yeah. good challenges collected. So just be mindful, you can still add to the Padlet, even though we might go back to the slides. Breakout okay. rooms. Breakout rooms, exactly. So we've talked about your challenges. Now, of course, we want to share them so that there is a bit more information there, as well as, well, what do we do in those circumstances? 
And on the next slide, you will see the, the questions that we would like to ask you. So in the breakout rooms, and we are, we are thinking of having about three to four people in a breakout room who are randomly selected um, to share things. And you'll have about 20 minutes in the breakout rooms. And so with three to four people, that is a good amount of time to also briefly introduce yourself if you don't already know the people that are with you in the breakout room and then share your challenge. If you already have it on the Padlet, then you're welcome to uh, refer back to it, give a bit more information about it, but that should be the shortest part of, the, uh, um, of your challenge because we do want to spend, we want you to spend on time on finding strategies to resolve your challenge or to, to make it easier, to make it not such a big challenge for you. Um, and that's why we have the breakout rooms to see who uh, or what strategies do you as a group come up with? Maybe already because you've shared, um, you, you've done a number of, um, you've applied a number of strategies or you've heard others apply them. So please do feel free to share all of those things. And then if the challenge is on the Padlet, it would be fantastic so that everybody else learns about your strategies, that you add them as a comment to the challenge that is there so that we can very nicely see where it, um, to which challenge it belongs. So you'll be placed automatically in breakout rooms as soon as I click the create button. So have a great time meeting new friends and we'll call you back in about 20 minutes. All right, thank you so much everybody who participated in the breakout rooms and shared their challenges and also came up with strategies. And now, of course, we'd like to hear in what you have shared, uh, which challenges you discussed and also what strategies you came up with, if you'd like to share them. So does anybody want to volunteer? <laughs> Kind of so I'm I'm going to pick on a person <laughs> so that we don't have dead silence here. Um, Alison, I think you might know on whom I'm going to pick if you if you are keen to to share from your <laughs> to share what your group has discussed, what uh, challenges or challenge, even if it's just one um, that you have come across and what strategies you discussed, that would be wonderful to make a start. Maybe I can involve Michael and Adrian, who are also in my room as well, because I think Michael's uh, problem that he presented around the use of photos and videos. Michael, do you want to talk to that? Because I think it's your your problem and in terms of the <laughs> longer term impact of, you know, so there's permissions now to use these photos. So all kind of, you know, exactly what you'd expect to see, parents signing off to have their their, their child um, have a photo taken, but, but let's say then that the the teacher, the student educator, so the student learning to be a teacher, then uses that photo in the future outside of the context and what that might mean. Uh, so we thought that we use the word unintended consequences that that might have. Michael, do you want to add to that at all? Yes, uh, thank you, Alison. She facilitated our break um, room very well. So we're able to share big ideas and great ideas on how to um, give solutions to this uh, challenge. Uh, I just thought of that, although in the Philippines, we ask consent from our students whenever we upload photos or videos, uh, including their faces. And uh, these uh, kids are uh, protected by laws since that is for data privacy. I just thought of this that 
after some, let's say, for example, 10 or 20 years and still these photos are still online, um, how else can these be kids be protected in case that that was uh, that will be used for some unintended purpose in the future? Because uh, you know, cyberbullying has been in the, has been in the air for so long, and uh, we do not know after 10 or 20 years from now what will happen to these uh, materials. And uh, so, in the breakout room, it was suggested that if uh, we can only take photos which do not show their uh, faces and we can have the photos of their hands or of their output, something to that effect. Because uh, we cannot uh, um, remove these uh, photos or videos um, for the benefit of the visual learners as we learn from, as we learn much if uh, we see something on the screen. That's all, thank you, Alison. Thank you so much, uh, Michael and Alison for sharing the challenge and that is, certainly one that is most likely becoming more and more important because more and more people take photos of people and put them online. Um, does anybody here in the room might have another strategy that they think could be applied in this case? I'm just mindful of the one you had, Christina, where everyone else is thinking um, um, about blurring out faces. Mm -hmm. You do see that as a strategy online. Um, yeah, well. and so that, um, that could be something that uh, Michael might also want to do or is already doing, that you, you see a lot kind of people put smiley faces on rather than just blurring things out. So that is one possibility so that you still get the context there. Because, of course, in some study programs, you'd, you do need to show the interactions between people, and uh, that can be very tricky then. Um, one strategy that I thought for this context was that when, when we do get the consent from, uh, from the parents in this case, of course, that it might be, be able to make it more specific for what the consent is or for how long it is, or um, also what measures the parents or later on the students who, who get older have in order to have their content removed so that there might be an address from an uh, or a general administrative address if there is somebody who has access to those materials in order to remove them when they are especially publicly available. And that similarly to what Christina does in her classes in Germany, that knowing about these rules is important and that students do know that they have to follow them. So if they get a request to have a photo, certain photo removed, that they do that and that they don't use it for unintended purposes and reuse the photo somewhere else when it has only been allowed, say, for the portfolio. Thank you so much for sharing that link, Susan. Uh, just to, to have it also on the recording, um, you mentioned that your college has information for students on media consent and copyright. You are very welcome to place the link on the Padlet. I will also uh, make a copy of the chat and then share any of the links in the resources after the webinar so that people can look mm. at it. So I, I, you might have seen those who are looking at the Padlet. I've just changed one of the challenges to other resources and asked Susan to put it in under there. So if anyone else has got other resources, they could post it as well. Thank you, Christine. Does any other group would like to share a challenge that you discussed and the resulting strategies that you could come up with? Surely someone must have, um, oh, we've got Carolyn, because I was gonna say someone must have talked about artificial intelligence, but. Carolyn, go first. Oh, hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity today. I'm uh, finding it uh, very uh, useful and interesting to be part of a group that's uh, looking at this. The um, first one there, acknowledging AI-generated content, I'm curious, the person who, who noted attributing co-authorship of AI, whether they happen to have access to a model uh, from some other forum that they've been uh, discussing this, um, and there's been a recommendation of the of the way that that attribution might be framed or structured. Has that person got?
got a model. That, that was me. Um, I don't. I I could dig one out out of my email. I it was it's just basically some language that I think is going to be. Uh, it seems to be what where APA and MLA are going. That they are, you know, recommending some model language for uh, co-authoring because it, you obviously want to attribute if you even if you've made quite a few revisions to what say chat GPT spat out. Yeah. Um, so, so it's been, uh, our understanding is that like all of the major citation styles will be coming up with something official, but in the meantime, there was something I can, while we're still on, I'll see if I can find that language and I'll plunk it in to the Padlet. That'd be terrific, Susan. Thank you. Because um, it's, it's in uh, the, the unit, we've put it in as a discussion point uh, for the first um, micro assignment. Think, yeah. And and I'm 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 aware of it all, and I'm playing around with it, but I haven't got to the point of knowing. I haven't got any models. I'll see what I can find. Give me a minute. <laughs> sure. um, Thanks kindly. Thanks, Susan and Caroline. There's also a number of universities or other institutions that are actually putting out how to cite ChatGPT or AI for their students as well. Yes, I should have a look. We've only started the semester. Yeah, today. so starting just... today, so it's kind of like I've got to get my um, motors yes. going. Yes, of course, other institutions may well have something. Well, yeah. that might, yeah, that might just give you the heads up as well. Good tip. Thanks kindly. We're, we're in this space, I'm quite heavily involved in this space and we're all collaborating. Yeah. We're all yeah. learning at the same at the same time. So collaboration is the way to go. Terrific stories. Yeah, thank you. One of the challenges that did catch my attention, of course, was the distinguishing fake sources from authentic ones. Yes, po. Okay. So, I'm from St. Mary's College of Mekawaya, and thank you for this opportunity to be with you. Okay? And um, I just wrote this as one of the challenges that I, for myself, is really uh, experiencing right now. Okay? Why? Because um, a lot of papers are really on my plate right now, and um, uh, either online or uh, printed ones. So, that's that's how I think of it. Like while checking the the, the examinations that I uh, that these teachers are really passing on to me, are these authentic ones? Okay, are these authentic? How am I, how how could I know or how will I know if these are the authentic ones? Did I did they really do this or did they just copyright it or copy from the internet? So in that sense. Uh, there, are, these are really the questions that are running on my mind. And then, aside from that, aside from the examination, um, other papers that the students are passing on to us. Though we have our um, platform in the school, we have this uh, Google Workspace. We could also check this. Now, while um, during the breakout room, we were also with the other um, employees in the in the same. I think that's the bad weather catching up with us now in the Philippines. Institution. So we basically use our Google Workspace in checking again. So when students actually submit um, outputs, we basically use the um, the Google Workspace. We're in. We just check on checking of check on plagiarism. So that's one way we can really distinguish if whether they that's an authentic answer or not. And then aside from that, a uh, good thing that we have also our Turnitin, wherein um, teachers can really um, use this platform so that we can put everything that are to be, submit, to be submitted. And um, yeah, we can check also if these are plagiarized or not. And then what else? We, uh, so that's all. That's, I think, what we can use as our strategies. Now, look, looking after at this other resources that you presented a while ago, I think uh, this really helped us, no? Yung pong, uh, this concept and copyright information. Kasi when I, um, when I am thinking no, of our student handbook, we only ask our parents to write, to, to to sign the entirety of our handbook but we do not have this specific paper wherein they could really uh, give us the consent permission 
everything that will be uploaded by our students, everything that will be posted on their uh, social media will be uh, with their consent. So this might be of help to us. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for sharing that. And not just sharing your challenge, but also the strategies that you have started to employ. And of course, for assessment, uh, plagiarism or similarity checkers are one possibility. And I know that Turnitin is working on also identifying AI generated content because it does apparently follow a number of rules so that there might be a possibility to identify at least some of it. And so we'll see over the coming month what that will look like. Susan, you have your hand up. Well, I just wanted to say, I've, I, I don't know, probably other people have seen that uh, beta video that Turnitin um, released. It is a bit concerning that they said that there's parts that they can definitely identify and parts that they think are definitely not, but there was a whole bunch that they said could be and could be not. So we're going to have to be really careful with, and I think any detection tools I've sort of been doing a deep dive into this and even like um, GPT-0, those kind of things, there's, seen, there's a lot of hedging, a lot of, well, it might be, might be not. So we definitely don't want to get into falsely accusing students. So we're going to have to, I mean, I think the way to go is to a large degree, much more authentic assessment that can't be outsourced to a bot <laughs> is, yeah. you know, is the best thing that we can probably be doing. But, uh, but yeah, it's a little bit, it, it, that's something that sort of has raised some red flags to me is that it's not, it's not very, they can't be very certain and what they're identifying from what I've seen so far. So, yes, that, uh, that is, um, you, you put the finger on it because the, uh, the text, of course, is always generated and some of it might be easily identifiable, whereas others does isn't yeah. because it is written in a very conversational way. Or you can mimic certain writing styles with uh, generative AI. And so, yeah, there will be lots of conversations, lots of ways, well, how can we incorporate it? And your, uh, your last point, Susan, also points to the, the thing that, of course, comes up for us in the portfolio world, that portfolios often do allow for more authentic assessment. And what does it mean then for AI? Uh, is, is AI a threat? Is it not a threat in as much as with other assessments, um, less so, more so? And so we are actually interested to know from you, and I didn't set up a poll beforehand, so I can't poll you directly, but if you'd just like to indicate in, in the chat, if you'd be interested in participating in a webinar on artificial intelligence and portfolios, so that we know if we should be looking into that as a way of sense making, not really so much sharing solutions because <laughs> they, they are still a bit far away most likely, but at least sharing of experiences, sharing, well, what, what possibilities do we have? Um, what do we need to look at? What do we need to be careful about? What traps should we not fall into? and the like to just come together as a community in order to explore that topic more. Um, so I've seen a few thumbs up. So Alison, that might be something where Abel and um, ePortfolios Australia could partner on again. So let's, let's talk about it um, maybe later in the week and see um, how, that, how we might be able to facilitate that for our community. Thank you so much, everybody, for sharing your challenges and uh, some of the strategies. The Padlet will still be available, so you can take a look, take a screenshot, ponder the challenges more for yourself, see if you're encountering them as well. And maybe you have the opportunity within your own institution to talk about them and see how you want to resolve them for you. Because often, of course, there is a local context involved. And what works in New Zealand might be different in Australia, might be different to the Philippines, and will certainly most likely be very different in the United States and other countries. Therefore, um, discuss it in your context and also engage with conversations in other um, 
areas in at conferences and with people in the wider portfolio community. Now that we are getting towards the end of our session, we do want to share a few things with you um, where you can engage with the rest of the community. And so we have um, a workshop coming up that is organized by ABLE. It's called Rock Your Portfolio. It is with uh, Dr. Sheetal Patel. She works at LinkedIn and is also working at Stanford University together with Helen Chen. That workshop is offered twice. So that's why the dates are a bit weird um, because accounting for different dates and times makes it quite hard to just put one date there. So it will be offered on the 30th of March for the Northern Hemisphere, in particular Europe and the United States. That will be the 31st of March already for Asia, New Zealand, Australia. Um, and then there will be a workshop also on the 31st of March US time, which is then the 1st of April already for us um, down here. So do check the registration link. I did put it into the chat and your time zone should be calculated correctly from the start on the registration page. Now, ePortfolios Australia is offering um, sessions where you can work directly on your portfolio. They are called pair sessions. And Alison, if you'd like to say a couple of words about them, then I'd love to hand over the microphone to you. Thank you, Christina. And thank you, Christine, for both of you for running the session. But the pair stands for, I'll put it in the chat, plan, act, reflect, and we call it ePortfolio. So we, ePortfolios Australia talk about ePortfolio practice. So it's the process of developing the portfolio and the skills developed. Developing the portfolio is uh, where, really where the, a lot of value comes. So they're an hour and a half session. Of that hour and a half, we have, it's like a, I think they call it a Pomodori style approach. So the first 10 minutes is to find out what people's goals are, or is there any problems that people want to try to address in, the, in developing their own e-portfolio or maintaining their own e-portfolio. And then um, 30 minutes, don't care, get me, it's about 30 minutes, just dedicated time. So no talking, everybody turns off their video, dedicated time to work on your e-portfolio. We stop in the middle for 10 minutes, get an update again, check in, is there any, anything that people are wanting to share or get some support with? And then another solid 30 minutes of uh, working on your e-portfolio and then 10 minutes at the end to debrief and action for moving forward. I'll just say one more thing, Christina. If you are you haven't started your own e-portfolio and you don't really know where to start, we also then will do a breakout room and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people to give them some ideas on how they can start their own personal uh, e-portfolio as well. So thank you for the chance to speak. Um, Alison, you might just while you're there, you might like to share about the ePortfolio Forum. So then, yes, we, we have our annual forum. This will be our 12th forum. Um, I always attribute the reason we started or continued uh, into forums is from Christina's uh, poke of somebody uh, uh, about running a, another one. So we held one in 2012. And then Christina said to somebody, oh, that would be really good to you to hold at University of Canberra. And that ball then started rolling and we're still moving forward. So the 12th, the 11th to 12th of October, Australian dates, if you're in our zone, and it will be dual delivery, but it will be coming out of Darwin uh, in the Northern Territory. So very exciting time to come and visit Darwin if you haven't been there or revisit if you have been there. And we will be releasing very shortly the call for proposals. And so we encourage everybody, to, regardless of time zone experience, background, it will be dual delivery. You can submit recordings and so on. So please keep an eye out. Um, I'm, I might drop a little link in the chat for ePortfolios Australia if people would like to follow what we do. So thank you both again for your session and for the opportunity to share that. 
Thank you very much, Alison. And I just noticed that I have not yet put in the other links because they were on a separate page. So I'll put the links into the chat now um, where you can see more about ePortfolio, the ePortfolio forum, where updates will be posted. And the, the easiest way to really get any updates from ABLE and ePortfolios Australia is to subscribe to our newsletters. So you have the links to them in the chat as well. Alison does a fantastic job for ePortfolios Australia. There's always lots and lots of links included. Then um, remind us also about events coming up and um, other things. And in the ABLE newsletter, we do keep it fairly short. It does come out once a month, um, typically now on the second Tuesday of a month, so that we have a schedule and there you will learn about upcoming events and other resources that we've come across over the last month. So please do feel free to subscribe to them in order to not miss out on any of the online events that are running throughout the year and also any face-to-face -face events. We haven't yet put on the, uh, we, we don't yet have the dates for the ABLE conference. Um, at the moment it is still planned, so please do watch out for any announcements that will come through. And so that takes us to the very end, so you can finish on time and uh, get to your next activities. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please do feel free to send an email to Christine or to me or catch us on social media. Here we have the handles for Twitter, but we are also on LinkedIn and I'm also on the Fediverse with that same handle. Last but not least, we'd like to hear your feedback. If you'd like to say a few words, what you liked, what we can improve on the workshop, what you might like to see in the future, please do uh, fill in the form so that we can take a look at that afterwards. You will receive the link to the recording once we have it edited and also transcribed. Um, and then you will get an email, those that have registered through Humanitex. Um, in order to just know when all of those resources are available and they are publicly, they will be publicly available so that you can share them with your colleagues. Thank you so much for coming along today and I'll hand over to Christine for the very last word today. Yes, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. It's been great to share with people from across different parts of the world. And, um, you know, we encourage you to attend and, and, and in the feedback particularly, tell us ways that might be more useful for you because I realise some people don't have good internet connection or there could be some language challenges or whatever it is, um, time zones. We're really um, interested in your feedback to be able to make these opportunities to share and learn together, um, you know, more suitable to you. So yes, we just encourage you to look out for the next webinars that are coming along and hope to see you then.